Good evening, everyone. Uh, I particularly delighted to have Dr. Urs Ling with us tonight. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, because I think it's very difficult to find an expert in a particular subject, which is both a leading scholar as well as a leading practitioner. And I think that Dr. Slim represents both in, a, in, a, in an excellent way. Uh, Dr. Slim also works as a frontline, uh, as a humanitarian worker. Uh, we've saved the children in the UK, and then eventually with the United Nations, in Morocco, in Sudan, in Ethiopia, in Bangladesh, in the Palestinian territory, so a lot of hands-on experience. Now, at the same time, Dr. Slim is also a senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute of Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict at the University of Oxford. Um, he's uh, leading uh, uh, research on humanitarian ethics. Uh, he has established the Oxford Humanitarian Group within the university, within the institute there. Um, and he started his university career in 1994 as he was appointed reader in international humanitarianism at Oxford Brookes University. Has published extensively, and his uh, last most written book is The Humanitarian Ethics, a guide to the morality of aid in war and disaster. So I think you all agree with me that we have the perfect expert tonight to talk uh, about the topic on our agenda, um, the future of war you know, and its humanitarian implications. Now, I've been studying and observing conflict in the last 14, 15 years of my career. And there is no doubt that there is a transformation already happening in, in warfare, and of course more is coming. Uh, some people might think that this is just driven by military technology. Obviously, there is an element like that uh, to take into consideration. But it's not just technology. Uh, there's a lot of other trends that, that have implication. Uh, demographic trends, uh, urbanization. Uh, but even uh, geopolitical shifts, which are somehow transforming approach, for example, and the way humanitarian, international humanitarian law is seen. So all these different trends are playing out in a, in a very interesting way. I think it's going to be very interesting to hear from, uh, from Hugo Slim how all these things come together and also the implication for the kind of job you are doing. Let me just conclude on a, on a more personal note, uh, because we're going to talk a lot about transformation and change. Uh, but I think it's very important that we all remember that the ICRC and humanitarian law have very deep roots. Um, my mom is in Geneva. So 15 years ago, I brought my future wife, wife to be, to Geneva. And because I'm a very romantic person, I brought her to the museum of the ICRC. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she still married me, so here you go. Uh, and I got this book, okay? So this a book, which is The Memory of Sol Ferino, which was written by rather wealthy Swiss businessman who in, uh, um, uh, in, in his time, uh, we're talking about the mid-1800, okay, um, didn't really witness a battle, but he witnessed the consequences of this battle. Um, and I want to mention this battle because I was born a few kilometers from the site of this town, Soferino, which happened to be in North Italy. Uh, Soferino was a battle between a, a, a coalition of French and Italian armies uh, against the Austrian, it was very much part of our Italian sort of independent war. Uh, obviously, much has changed. This big confrontation between armies on flat land, right? Three hundred people—that's the estimate. 10, sorry, three hundred thousand people. The estimate. War is not like that anymore. But there is obviously an element of it which is the human suffering, which is there. And wherever you know, I, I personally have been, and I'm sure Dr. Muslim has been in his life look, looking and witnessing the consequences of war, we've seen that human suffering there. So there are deep roots, and I think the deep roots are not just historical, but are very much in an essential uh, need in, in, in human beings, which is alleviating uh, human, su uh, human suffering in these circumstances. And it is within this context that then we have to think about the change in adaptation the upcoming trends. Um, the way we're going to do it is I'll, I will give to Dr. Sleva 20, 25 minutes to give us some of his thought, and then we will be very happy to take questions and comments from the audience. Welcome. Thanks again for being here. You have the floor. 
Francesco, very, thank you very, very much for such a warm uh, welcome and introduction. It's, um, it's great for me to see Singapore and to come and see and experience a bit of Singapore's academic um, culture. Because when you are not in Singapore, you hear that Singapore has these interesting places and interesting people, and you're aware of this university, of this policy center, and of other places in Singapore um, where you're seeing things being written from and you're hearing it's an influential place. So when I was able to come to Singapore, I was very keen to come and um, be an academic again and sit in front of you and try and think with you um, for an hour or so. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, of course, as someone from Oxford, one has mixed feelings about Singapore because, of course, it's a huge success, but it's linked to Cambridge. And that's always difficult for us in Oxford. We wish that Lee Kuan Yew had gone to Oxford, but he chose Cambridge, and he's a wise man, so he must have made the right decision. But it's very nice to see Singapore and to be in front of um, people from this, this important university. Francesco has mentioned ICRC, and I'm just going to explain a tiny bit of who we are. We are the International Committee of the Red Cross, and I'm here with two colleagues, Isabel, who's our regional um, head of delegation from, in Kuala Lumpur, who covers several countries, and Jacqueline as well from the Kuala Lumpur delegation, who leads our communications team. We are a big global organization. We're over 155 years old, as Francesco said. We have 80 delegations around the world. We work from top to toe in war. So we have teams all over the world working hard to protect and assist civilian populations, prisoners of war, wounded people in armed conflict in all the big wars around the world. And we also have humanitarians in suit, like Isabel, Jacqueline, and I, who go around trying to work at the diplomatic level, working with states to influence the way war is conducted, to promote the Geneva Conventions. We are mandated as the guardians of the Geneva Convention, and we are mandated with a neutral um, role in armed conflict in the Geneva Conventions as well. So that's who we are. In a way, we're the part of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement that works on armed conflict and in armed conflict, and we are a neutral, impartial, and independent Swiss organization, um, which goes back to roots near Francesco's hometown. My title, Future Warfare and Humanitarian Implications, I usually try and avoid talking about the future because I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. And I usually prefer to talk about the present or the past, something I feel there is evidence for and we can talk with certainty. Um, so I usually avoid the future, but I thought it was interesting to try and talk about it with you this evening because, as Francesco has already said, there are some key trends at the moment that make it very hard to avoid talking about the future. In a sense, if we don't try and look ahead um, as humanitarians, as people concerned with armed conflict, um, we would be irresponsible at the moment. Because there are things happening which means that we should try and look 5, 10, 20 years ahead, which is what I'm going to try and do a little bit. As Francesco said, if we look at the big trends at the moment, we have this fascinating moment of the real reordering of global power. Um, with the rise of your part of the world, with Asia coming back um, to its rightful position as you know, a major area of civilization, power, ideas, um, etc. Um, that is an important part. We also have the technological move. And as Francesco also said, we are, without doubt, on the verge of another what they call RMA, a revolution in military affairs. And we're on the verge of one of those now with the technology that is now available to everyone. We also have an increasing sense that we live in a fragile world. Although more people are educated, more people are in better health than ever before, more people are richer than ever before, there is a sense of insecurity, of fragility about our environment about our global change in politics, about are we reaching human limits? Are we reaching the limits of being human on this planet with the environment, with our changing demography and growing population, with um, our technology? Is it going to take us beyond the human somehow? So there is a sense of 
unease about the future, which is normal, um, but it's particular at this point. And also, there are new spaces in our world now. There is virtual space. So two billion of us are on a thing called Facebook. We live a lot of our lives in another space. I'm old, but I'm often struck by how when I'm walking amongst people or with people, they are not where they are. Okay? They are somewhere here in another place, talking to someone in another country, engaging in another space. They are not where they are. And that's a new thing, because people used to be where they were in front of you when I was growing up. Um, they might have been reading a newspaper, but that was about it. So that change in space and the change in urban space, we are an urbanizing species now. We are an urbanizing world. And of course, the conflict, that means that conflict and violence is urbanizing too. And outer space is now a genuine prospect for us in many ways. And so many of the big new powers in the world have space programs as well. And of course, of particular interest to the ICRC, the number of wars is now increasing again. So after a period, sort of from 2005 onwards, when wars then slowed down and we had fewer wars than for a long time, the graph is going up again. There are now at least over 40 wars, armed conflicts around the world. It's most non-international, but an increasing number of international armed conflicts played out in internationalized civil wars. So this means that the ICRC, we, we are doing some hard thinking about the future environment. So if I may, what I would like to do with you for the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes, is think aloud with you. I cannot cover all the different aspects of future warfare, so I'll focus. I want to think aloud with you, and then I want to listen to you. And I must make this clear that this is not ICRC policy I'm talking. And I must also make it clear to you that I don't come from deep within a security studies discipline, or I'm not a sort of hard geopolitical person. I'm actually a theologian originally, and I work and think mostly in ethical terms. So you're not going to hear a hard realist account or a constructivist account of international relations going forward from me. You'll just hear some probably quite simple reflections on what these changes means for us as human beings. I want to think about five things, really. I want to start with war as a human problem and just talk about war as a problem of our species that we have seem to always have had. Then I want to look at what ICRC is noticing on the battlefield today. So as we work amongst it and on it and around it, what are, what are we seeing? And then I want to ask three questions about the future. The first one is, will war remain a clearly defined activity in the international relations of the future? Will we still recognize war? Or is it becoming very blurred, and actually it's not as easy to see violence and conflict today as war as the way we used to? So there's an identity question. Is it war? The second question I want to ask is, will war remain a human activity in the future? Will war remain a human activity in the future? Because people have always said war is a human activity. But the way we are going with technology now, Will war remain a human activity or not? And the third question I want to ask is, will suffering in war be similar or different in the future? So I'll make a bash at some of those, and then we can discuss them, and then you can raise questions that I, I haven't raised, because I can't raise all of them. To start with war as a human problem, to my mind, war is one of our four big species strategic challenges, the four perennial challenges we face as a species. First is war, our relationship with violence. We are always struggling with our violence as a species and with our relationship with violence as a species. And the formalizing of this thing called war, armed conflict, is our normative attempt to manage our violence in international relations. That's our first species strategic challenge. But there are probably three others. The second is our relationship and our struggle with fairness as a species. And that raises all the questions of equality and poverty 
and how we treat each other and create societies that are equal, unequal, fair, unfair, where some are very rich and some are very poor. That's really our second sort of species strategic challenge, probably. The third one is our health and our relationship with our predators, if you like, the things that try to kill us, diseases, diet, food, environment. This is also, I think, one of our four species strategic challenges, our relationship with our health and our survival in the face of predators of different kinds. And then four is our relationship with our environment, the challenge of humanity being a steward. How can we keep this environment going on which we have depended so far in our life, which we love as a beautiful environment and which we need as an existential environment? So those four challenges, I think if we talk about war, we're talking about one of our big four species um, challenges. And the origins of war are unclear. Some people would say that war emerged because we were hunters. So we took up weapons to hunt. And humans were not just predators, we were also prey. Right back in our early days, we were preyed on. So we had this experience of being chased, of being hunted, being eaten, and we then developed weapons and turned the table and had this experience of being a predator and preying on others. So in some ways, hunting is probably where we got going with our violence in some ways. And it also became a blood right of some kind, the business of killing another species usually. And it became an existential right of some kind because we realized we were taking life to eat it and protect ourselves from it. And it became a particularly male blood right. Because if we think about it, and any of you who have given birth, or any of you who have watched someone giving birth, will realize that women already have a profoundly existential blood right, a rite of passage in their own lives, which is a life and death experience for them. And men don't have anything really like that, so it's possible that men invented and felt the need for a comparable blood right, where they too had to face death in some existential way and come through it in some experience. Maybe as well, that was part of the origins of our organized violence. But whether it comes from the hunt and or a male blood right, it is primarily an organized male activity. So armed conflict and war and the pursuit of war and the practice of war has, for time immemorial, a very close relationship with masculinity and a certain kind of masculinity. And that already poses one question, is that as we are living in a world of increasing gender inequality, as I sit before a, a, woman, a room of as many women, in fact, Oxford this year, for the first year, we are more women than men students in our history. That poses an unanswered question. Will the rise of women in some way shape the fall of war and the decline of war? We have to pose that question. If there is something particularly masculine about the taking up of arms and the killing of our own species. War went on, I think, soon to become a means of power. And obviously, it became a political instrument for control of territory, conquest, and control of others. It became an instrument of politics very soon. But it also achieved an epic importance as a defining mark of largely male character. So violent men, warriors, could be awful and terrible and brutal or they could be noble and heroic and use the force of their weapons for good. So war became a political instrument and an instrument of definition and character and of virtue as well. War had two faces, and it's always kept those two faces, and we'll come back to that. War is ambivalent. It destroys and it makes new things as well. The earliest human story we have written down, the, first, the, the earliest story that was written down on clay tablets in writing, 
from Mesopotamia, Iraq today, is the story of Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which some of you may have read. And it's a wonderful story because it's our oldest written story. And it's about our relationship with violence. And it's about a brutal, powerful man called Gilgamesh, half god, half human, who runs a city with brutality. And the gods challenge him, and the people rise up and say, get this violent man off us. He's ruining our lives. So they send a huge other violent creature to be his equal and his friend, and they stop tyrannizing the city and go off in a noble quest to kill bad things and kill monsters and everything you expect. And that is our first written story about what it means to be human, particularly what it means to be a human man, of course, and try and work out this violence thing. So that remains a question for us. What do we see on the battlefield today as the ICRC? What do we, what do we see before us? I'm going to give you some numbers. I've said we see an increase in wars, over 40 now. We see 128 million people in urgent need of protection and assistance in various wars. We see 65 million people forcibly displaced and fled from their homes. We see one in every two children dying under five in deeply conflicted areas and war. We see 1.5 billion people in the world today living in conflicted, at-risk, fragile, violent countries. And we see a war damage and cost in development reversals and destruction of about $14 trillion a year, which is 14% of global GDP. And if we were to look at the trends we see on the battlefields, ICRC sees wars as long wars. We worked out, and looking at our top 10 field operations, we've been in each of those for an average of 36 years. Iraq, Afghanistan, Democratic Republic of Congo, places like this. We have been there for years. So wars are long, and our job is almost perpetual in some of these situations. We see an urbanizing battlefield. We see urban space being destroyed and changed by armed conflict. And we see new urban space developing because people are fleeing and going to towns like Maiduguri in northern Nigeria and rapidly increasing those towns. Little small towns become big cities. And the most famous city in the world, Venice, in Francesco's country in Italy, was a city made by IDPs, internally displaced people, in the wars of the Goths storming down and pushing um, Italian peoples um, in the 8th century or something um, AD. And those people fled into the marshes and swamps of that part of Italy on the coast and created the world's most beautiful city, which is an extraordinary story. So war destroys city, and it create, changes urban space and builds new ones. We are seeing increasing armed groups, non-state armed groups. In the last seven years, more armed groups have formed than in the last 70 years. So we have hundreds of armed groups now. But we also see coalition warfare on the ground. We see big, powerful states taking sides again in the conflicts of today, being on different sides, and fighting as coalitions of powerful states, regional states, and armed groups. So mixed coalitions. That's how wars are being fought. We see this great power split. In the ICRC, it's interesting. If we look at the permanent five members of the Security Council, we see four of them routinely at war. France, Britain, America, and Russia. Four permanent members routinely belligerent. We see one permanent member, interestingly, China, who does everything to avoid war, who has a policy of non-interference with military power and hard power in that way. And that is a minority. But that is a rising power. And it will be interesting to see in the future how China's view of war and holding back from war, if and how that changes the patterns of others, and if it stays in the same way. We see violations of the Geneva Conventions all the time in the conduct of hostilities, in the treatment of prisoners, in the um, forced displacement of civilians. But we also see respect for international humanitarian laws sometimes. We see people accepting humanitarian convoys coming through to feed people. We see some prisons getting better treatment of prisoners. We see some people changing their policies. So we see inhumanity and humanity. And we see a big humanitarian sector. $28 billion last year of humanitarian organizations like ours trying to implement a global ethic 
of humanitarian action in war. So now to my first question, and I'll whiz through them. Will war remain clearly a clearly defined activity in international relations? Conventionally, in the modern age, and even before, you knew war because a state would declare war against another state, and a war would take place, and it was recognizable as a war between states over a certain issue, over a certain territory. Not always, but sometimes. Today, we see a blurring. We see a blurring of international armed conflicts and non-international armed conflicts in the same space. We see multiple states and multiple armed groups with multiple motives in the same space. We see urban violence in parts of Latin America, particularly, which looks like war. The casualty figures in Mexico's urban violence, it took Syrian, the Syrian war three years to go higher than the death rates in Mexico's drug wars and urban violence. Thousands of people killed. So you have casualties and displacement of populations in urban violence that are war-like, but they are not war. You have a collapse of services. You have people like us being the only people that can work there because of our humanitarian method. And we have hybrid war, attacking other states through cyberspace, through soft power, but talking about attacking them, but not calling it war in the same way. We have trade wars. We have cyber attacks that might be criminal or that might be political. And we have this extraordinary phenomenon of the deniability of attacks, the anonymity of attacks, the problem of attribution. Who's doing this? And that makes it difficult, because that's not how we recognize war. We usually know who's doing it in armed conflict. So can we still recognize war today? Is war still one thing, or is it now many things? And will it go on like this into the future? Can we say clearly what it is, or is it like there's that famous judgment by a US judge about hardcore pornography? And he eventually said, look, I can't come up with detailed criteria, but I know it when I see it, and that's not it. And are we going to be like that about war? We're not sure, but we sort of know it when we see it, but we can't give it really um, categorical distinction anymore in the future. My second question, will war remain a human activity? And here we come to the question of weapons and actors in a new technological age. The question of human autonomy or machine autonomy in war. And this is the question in a sense, what is a weapon? Now, a weapon is something very ancient to us and goes back very much to those early days when we took things up to attack other things. A weapon is something that humans make and they take up. And the sword is the archetypal human weapon in the human imagination. It is a weapon which glistens on both sides in different ways. So a sword can be picked up, and it is double-edged in how it can be used morally. It can be used to do terrible things, to attack and torture and brutally kill innocent men, women, and children. And it can be used to do good things, to defend men, women, and children from an aggressor and to attack it back. The weapon has always been, if you like, ambivalent, morally neutral, and it depends on how we, as human beings, use it. It's the user and the context that dictates the morality of a weapon. This is why the ICRC refuses to say that rape is a weapon of war. Because rape is not a weapon. Rape is never a thing that could be good or could be bad, could be justifiably moral and others in a situation. Rape is always a moral outrage and a violent and atrocious act. And people talk about rape as a weapon of war, but we, we always refuse to and talk about weapon, rape as a method of war. Um, it's not a weapon because it can never be used responsibly and well. And that shows what a weapon really is. So what about the future? Robotic weapons. The ICRC's position is that if it's to be a weapon, there must be a human in the loop, as we say. There must be a human deciding what that weapon 
does and where it does it and how it targets. There must be a human in the loop, someone picking up the sword and wielding it, one side or the other. Because weapons are not accountable to international humanitarian law. Only human beings are accountable to international humanitarian law. You cannot put a sword on trial, and you cannot put um, an, a, a, a cruise missile on trial. You have to put the weapon holder, the user, and you need a weapons holder. But is that really what the future will be like? Because there will probably be something called fully autonomous weapons, where the human is out of the loop. Because our advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning and the so-called deep learning of machines now means that they can learn something quickly and then decide how they do it. Easily shown recently in, in the new machine that was developed by Google in London. I forgot what it's called, DeepMind or something, which didn't just learn, wasn't just programmed to play chess. It was programmed to learn games, any game. And so it learned Go in one and a half hours. It learned chess in one and a half hours and beat the best computer of the day. It's machine learning. It knows what to do. And maybe it'll change the rules one day and say, actually, the chess rules need to change. So need to change. This is where we're going, in a sense. And I really think this will happen. And it means that machines are no longer weapons. They are combatants. They will become combatants, not weapons. And that is a very profound moral thought and a pretty profound operational prospect. So I think this will happen. Robots will live. They will live with us. I think we will love robots, and we will hate robots. I expect my children, probably my grandchildren, and you to have relationships with robots and be fond of them. Like every object, we can love a painting. We can love a different species. We are, there are objects we love and are attracted to and we hate as well. And I think we will develop this relationship with deep thinking robots that probably some of your generation design. And then they do their thing. So robots may make new rules of war in the same way they may decide that actually there's a bit of the chess game that could be made more difficult or more fun if they change that rule. It could make new rules of war as they become autonomous, um, deep thinking machines. And war will no longer be a human activity. War will go beyond human activity. Or should we do everything we can to stop that? Is one of the limits of war, we talk in the ICRC about war has limits, is one of the most important limits of war that it always stays a human activity and that only humans can do it, even though they're brutal and atrocious when they do it, should we keep it that way? And some smart weapons are amazing in terms of the ability to be precise. I think, frankly, if I was a civilian in a war, I would prefer to be a civilian in a war where there were smart weapons operating than a civilian in the war in Vietnam, the American war in Vietnam, where there was carpet bombing of whole areas because they couldn't do precise targeting. So there's some things to be said for smart weapons with humans in the loop, but we can't be sure what machine weapons will do, machine combatants will do. So can we really regulate war if machines become combatants, not weapons? And will we, if we can't regulate it by law, will we have to regulate it by deterrence, as we did with nuclear weapons, in some kind of AI machine combatant arms race? Or, and I'll come back to gender, Will women save the day by coming into power and having a different interpretation of war, one detached from traditional masculinity and a male idea of war? Will they save the day? Will you, some of you, save the day? Question three, will suffering in war be similar or different? And then I must stop because I'm going over. I'm enjoying being an academic again after um, becoming a bit of a humanitarian bureaucrat. So here I fear we can expect continuity. War will continue to destroy. Winning will still be achieved by hurting, hurting other people, destroying places. And as in most wars, civilians will suffer most. In battle, by bombs and weapons damage and death, and from war, by the hunger, disease, and impoverishment that war produces. I'm afraid I think this will be an area of continuity going forward. 
War and winning will still be about hurting. Wars in virtual space will still target infrastructure and territory and morale of the enemy. In the tradition of war immemorial pillaging civilian populations, the amazing scandal when Britain was bombed for the first time from the air in World War I by German balloons and zeppelins, because this was the first time that an enemy weapon had reached behind the lines of war, deep into the civilian territory, and attacked civilians. And that was a scandal then that has become the norm. And that's what will happen in virtual space. It will continue to happen. And it'll be the civilian infrastructure of a state, of businesses, of hospitals, or whatever, that ends up being targeted and, and, and attacked. The principles of the Geneva Convention, the primary principles are humanity, that we must treat people as humanely as possible, even in war. Distinction, that we must distinguish between a military and civilian competent, non-competent target. Proportionality, we should always attack and defend in proportion to the threat. We can't just throw any bomb at a small target. And precaution, we must take precautions. There's nothing to stop those kind of principles being programmed into modern weapons. But they will always come up, as they do today, against the other principle in the Geneva Conventions, the principle of military necessity. Because it's military people that wrote the Geneva Conventions, and they wanted to retain the right to win a war. And that means they can always argue the military necessity of attacking in a certain way, in a certain place over those other values. And that will be structured into decisions machines or people make as they are now. But we will still care. I do believe we will still care, because I don't think we're going to change as a species. And always in our relationship with our violence, where we started, we have cared as much as we've also been cruel. Sometimes not as much, but care has always been there. So I think the humanitarian instinct, humanitarian law, will always be there. I'm going to stop. I'm sorry I've gone on too much. I've thought aloud with you. I've thought about war as a deep species problem that will continue unless women or robots transform it. I've talked to you about the new spaces of war, urban, virtual, and we can talk about outer space. I've talked about the difficulty of recognizing war as we knew it. And I think that difficulty in recognizing what's war, what's violence, what's other things, will become more and more difficult in the future. And I've talked about the turn to war as a non-human activity, possibly with machines making new rules about war. And I've talked about the continuity of human suffering and our appreciation, perhaps, I haven't talked about this enough, of non-human pain. I think. We will, on our caring side, develop greater care for the ecology and how is it damaged in war. I think we will go beyond our species to animals. I think if we develop the laws of war in future, it might be about protecting animals in <coughs> war as well. And I think it'll be about protecting robots in war, because I do believe we will make relationships with robots, and we will probably have rules about protecting them. I'm going to stop there, and thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you think. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was really great. I think so much to pick out. I have at least 5,000 questions going through my brain right now. Um, I wonder if I can abuse of my position just for one minute and maybe ask you one or two of these, and then open up as you kind of think of, of your own questions. Um, all these are extremely fascinating. Uh, uh, two things that you didn't mention, I wonder if this is something that it's, it's in your mind as well. Um, obviously, we talk about you know, warfare evolution, uh, technology, and so on and so forth, uh, but somehow there is also a, a war of the poor, right? Or those who don't have access to some of these technologies. And what a lot of people say is that obviously terrorism is the, the, the strategy of the weak, right? Or those who use fairly low tech kind of approaches. I wonder if this is something in, of, of your concern uh, of the use of, of these tactics that is used today, and it actually used in a lot of places where there is no, no open warfare. Um, Pakistan, for example, is at the top of the list together with Nigeria, but there's no actually a, a, an open warfare in these countries, 
very localized, obviously, in some areas. Uh, but these are the places where there are the highest number of victims of, for example, suicide attacks. And I wonder if you feel that this is an area in which you know, there will be a direction, particularly for non-state actors, to go. Or maybe technology will become so cheap that we have to, we can just think of using a commercial drone. Mm -hmm. We can just mm -hmm. go into a square without using a suicide bomb. Mm -hmm. So is, is that kind of sort of terroristic as a tactic, let's say, uh, something that is a concern? And the second question I have is, is related to your last point on pain. Um, as a, you know, uh, cyber attacks become part of the landscape, um, should we consider pain also losing my bank account? Should I consider pain losing all my data? Everything being completely wiped out. How how do I recover from something like that? Is is that part of the human suffering? Is there an evolution is, is of, of the human suffering there as well, which is going to be very hard to just quantify, obviously, but kind of grasp and address. Mm. Those are fascinating questions, and I, I'm not sure I can give clear answers on terrorism. I would say this. I would say that terrorism, in my mind, is asymmetric warfare. It's what you do if you're not particularly big and you've got a big, powerful enemy. Um, if you're small and attacking an elephant, you have to do certain things. Now, that's not a new form of warfare in any way. It's a very old form of warfare. It's a very logical form of warfare. Um, it's a very violationist form of warfare because it usually breaches the Geneva Conventions immediately by deliberately targeting civilians, which is a, a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, a major violation of international humanitarian law. The second thing I always want to say about terrorism um, is that it's not just non-state armed groups that do it. So in a sense, we have to realize that states, you can have terror states, you have states who commit acts of terror regularly and routinely. And I think if we were to be quantitative about this, um, we'd probably have to say that states commit more acts of terror than armed groups in terms of volume um, sometimes. So I don't want to sort of stereotype terrorism as being by only one type of actor. It is an act that can be done by any type of actor. Um, do I think it'll develop? Yes, I, I think, you know, we know one thing about tech these days. We know one thing about, you know, um, internet company tech boom is that they're often started by one person, you know, usually who's chucked out of college or walked out of college, sitting in their room, having a good idea, they can do it. Incredible things. They can come up with ideas. And I expect enormous ingenuity from non-state armed groups. Um, there already has been, and there will be. And I think you're right. I think we, you know, we won't see men, women, rushing into a room and shouting some um, great appeal. We'll see a machine that comes in, and that's it. You know, so I think. I think they will change, and they will do that too. Your question about pain and suffering is really interesting. I do believe that ethics evolve. You know, with new things, we have new ethical questions. We have new questions of what's good and bad, what's right and wrong, what's painful, what's pleasurable. And I do think, you know, it sounds like a first world problem that, you know, your bank account crashes because you've had an attack against, you know, your bank. But actually, I think you're right, it's not, because it depends what that depends on, and if you can't, go to a wall, put something in and get cash out, you can't feed your family. You know, it, I think it's, it may not be pain, but it will certainly lead to the kind of indirect suffering that usually hurts civilians more than bullets and bombs. I was actually thinking in a lot of countries, for example, Myanmar is an example, they're, you know, mo they're, they're uh, skipping one industrial revolution, yeah. right? So they're moving from basically non-infrastructure mm. to only sectors. Mm. So there's no even a backup mm. plan. The mm. entire system will be based on that. Yeah. And Africa is also the same. Mm. Uh, and so that can really put systems in, in huge yeah. danger and create yeah. huge, huge troubles. OK, enough for us to talk. Um, please, uh, just I have to ask you if you can just briefly introduce yourself. If you can please switch off the, the, the which on of the microphone, because we are recording the audio. So if you can just turn on the microphone when you speak. Now, first of all, thanks a lot, um, uh, Mr. Sin and uh, Mr. Kreswald. Like, usually when you're doing all the questions, my mind was like imploding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, brief introduction about myself. So, um, uh, currently I'm working as an investor, but looking to specifically this technology um, area. So, just now, you know, a lot of the questions that we raised is actually very relevant. 
you know, these are the questions that, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of development in terms of like, innovation. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, kind of want to say, wait a minute, with all this development, right? I was just wondering where this is going to carry, you know, us in terms of the regulation, in terms of risks. Um, but maybe since we're actually here in our uh, university, just maybe let me just start my kind of a few points with a very academic kind of point of view. So I think um, in terms of the nature of law, to me it's always a struggle of resources. Now, um, why that is relevant is if you look back into the history, resources always tie, uh, tie by the way to the kind of technologies that we have. So back in the days, let's say 2,000 years ago, we look at how Mongolians were kind of invading, you know, uh, if you look at into the Chinese history, it's always, you know, it's like a period of how Mongolians trying to attack the southern part of China where you have better climate, um, you have, you know, better agriculture, and it's pretty much a better living. So the resources critical there back then was basically two things. One is my land, the other is my people which basically, you know, are the sources to the labor, basically. Because back then, you were predominantly like an agriculture kind of society. Now, moving forward, I think we are seeing technology evolving and has the critical resources also improving. So, you know, in the past two decades, we're seeing, you know, oil and energy becomes the critical resources. And now this is my point of argument. I'm going to say today, we're actually seeing the next, I'm not sure if you've heard about this, but, um, People kept saying, especially the talks with folks from Silicon Valley, they're saying data is the new oil. Basically, um, the data that I, that I know, for instance, if I use Uber, if I use Airbnb, I know basically where you always travel to at what point in time. And does that basically kind of tell me what, how do you behave as a person in terms of habits, etc.? And if you look at what, you know, um, the very recent Facebook incident, that's exactly what has happened. So people have access to what you liked. So not only they can say, oh, what topics do you like, they can actually analyze what kind of keywords are you sensitive to. They can actually see, you know, uh, what is the best way to actually persuade you. So by the way, Francisco, to me, right, my biggest fear is not the loss of my data. My, my biggest fear is how people can look into my data and then actually predict how I would behave and has actually manipulated me in the way that I want. So I'm not sure if you actually heard, um, actually, um, can I ask you a question? Sorry? Can you ask me a question? What is your question? Your question? Your question? Yeah. Sorry. Because um, I'm actually trying to answer uh, Mrs. Lim's question on what do we think there's a clear form of law today? My answer is I don't think there is. Yeah. Because um, there are two ways. One is trade law. Um, you just look at how ZT has been, you know, the company is struggling on surviving today if America just fired bad IQ to them. Second, back to the data, data privacy issues, is that the, the danger is the world might be going without you even realizing. That's, that is my biggest yeah. fear. Um, what new technologies can do um, for humanitarianism in an operational sense, but also what they might potentially do to humanitarianism as a field or a doctrine, a principle-based practice. Um, a lot of the work I look at is on cyberspace, and that's what my question's about. Um, as you, as you mentioned, and increasingly, uh, um, uh, contemporary weapons are, are drawing on cyberspace to coordinate uh, amongst themselves and create kind of meta systems. And at the same time, you have humanitarian technologies that are also drawing on cyberspace to improve their management of data as part of this broader trend of growing connectivity worldwide. Um, um, my question is whether given this level of, of hyper-connectivity, which almost raises questions of the separateness of entities. Um, to what extent is this challenge humanitarian principles like independence, for example? Do you see a potential threshold in connectivity after which humanitarian independence no longer makes sense? Mm -hmm. And is that something that humanitarian organizations need to bear in mind as they consider how they should embrace uh, new technologies? Great. Well, thank you all very much. On, I mean, on the first one, there's your comment, I think it's, I mean, I agree with a lot of what you said. I, I particularly agree with your last point. I think you put it very well when you said war can be happening without us knowing it. I think that's very important, and I think that is probably a bit different, because um, we probably used to hear it, see it, smell it, and, you know, we realized it was war. But you're right. I think that's a very interesting way of putting it. Um, on your other point, about resources. Yeah, I, I wasn't thinking causally 
um, in this one, what will be the causes of future war. But of course, resources will have a place. Although I'm not a sort of homo economicus theorist to the core, I, I think if I look around, I think most of the conflicts I see are actually ideologically driven about the power of ideas and people's belief in, in certain ideas and how certain futures should be. Um, they're not all about resources. And I think it's economists often tend to persuade us that they are. But um, probably people we meet in war are usually more ideological than resourceological, actually, when we deal with them. I don't know if Isabel feels that, but um, it's, it's certainly both. Uh, in, in the game. So there's a really a very high temptation of using these uh, autonomous fainted drones to fight the war. And consider the fact that it is really the big power who is using those drones. So this now comes to a point of how do you define war crimes? When the drone commit and using chemical weapons on the field, and then the line of uh, command responsibilities. So I think that how are you going to address this issue of war crime? How are you going to address this issue of command responsibilities? And consider the fact that it's the leading power that is going to venture first into this autonomous warfare game. Do you think the international organizations have any hold on these powers, major powers, to decide what is the view of the game? Yeah. Great questions. That question is really about the challenge of what you know, the theorists call the moral distance. The, the question of distance, psychological distance and moral distance when you're not there with your sword actually hacking into Francesco. You know, and you do it in a slightly different way where you never, see, you never meet him, whatever, um, and you get this machine to go and do it. So there's two things there. I think the argument about moral distance is over-exaggerated in drones and when humans are in the loop. And I would urge you, there's a film called Eye in the Sky. Have you seen it? With Helen Mirren and others. It was Alan Rickman's last film. He died making it. Not because he was making it. He just died during making it. But it's an extraordinary thing because you're following these two drone pilots the whole time as they're having to make a decision of when to attack a, an Al-Shabaab house in Somalia. Actually, it's in Kenya, it's in somewhere up there. And how many civilians they're going to kill to do it. Now, you're just aware of them driving this drone. And what they can see with the technology is they can see the face of the little girls. They can see, they can see everything. I mean, they're really close in an extraordinary way. And then at the end of the film, having done everything, having made their decisions, having blown up things, you don't see them walking out of an airplane. You see them walking out of a container alongside hundreds of other containers on an air base in Arizona or somewhere. But the stress is just the same. So that film argues that distance doesn't change moral stress and psychological stress. Um, but there may, be, there may be new technologies where the human is out of the loop, where, of course, they're not stressed at all, and these machines are doing everything. And then you have the algorithm problem. Well, it wasn't me. It was the machine. You know. So I don't know what the answer to that is. And your point about will commanders prefer distance-based, intermediated machine killing because they'll have less PTSD? They, they might. I don't know. But um, we'll, we'll see. I don't know. It's hard to tell. I think people are getting a lot of stress in war anyway. Um, and when, when we hear about it, they're getting stressed in war because they're there for a long time, because it's unclear, because they don't really recognize the situation. It's ambiguous all the time. Mm. Yeah, one more, yeah. And then is that if you talk about remote control, that is, that people can control the field conditions. Yeah. But right now it seems that, aside from remote control, because artificial intelligence, we are going to have autonomous soldiers. Yes, yeah, I agree with that. So then, so, then, then I think we'll have stress from other things because they'll come and get us, you know. <laughs> so it'll be different. So, uh, building on the previous question and perhaps uh, my Chinese question to you earlier, with uh, gro growing global inequality, it's not going to be robot versus robot for a long time. What is more likely that it's going to be a robot versus a human being with a rock or, or something like that? A human being with a rock. Okay. So, like a a rock. so caveating that it would be possible and war is unavoidable, do you think it would be more ethical to provide the poor with robots? or to force everybody to fight with rocks. So, um, thank you very much for your insights today. My name is Wai and formerly I was with ICRC in Geneva. So, so very glad to see you here today. Thank you very much. Um, my question is about innovation, because we've been talking about the future of warfare, and we brought up uh, big data and partnerships. 
So I was wondering if you could share with us, uh, aside from the theory, something more concrete, maybe a few examples of what ICRC is doing in terms of innovating and how we can see uh, humanitarian actors moving forward to deal with uh, the future of warfare. I just wanted to kind of hear some of your comments on the current crisis that we see in Syria, particularly the impact that we're seeing on children, obviously humongous, but really bringing it back to the <coughs> conversation around the change of, of weapons and warfare that we see, particularly in that context, and the increasing use of chemical warfare. Have we learned enough about how to deal with the accountabilities of the impact of warfare when it's decades on? Um, particularly learning from what we've seen in Vietnam, um, and how how we tackle how to deal with the impact of warfare when it's not immediate in its generation. Like psychological second, third generation? Or yes, and, and, and the impact of uh, Oh I see, ah yeah. 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 And, okay. And the next so just easy questions in Singapore. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um Quang, I love your question, and I think it's a really interesting one. Um, should we, you know, give the Americans and the Chinese and the Russians rocks, level the playing field, or should we hand out some robots to level it up? Um, power won't work like that, of course, so it's a thought experiment in your mind, but it's a very interesting one. I actually think that, it's what I said earlier, I, I don't believe your theory entirely that it's really unfair, because I, picking up on what Francesco said, I think asymmetric violence will always find a way and always have a place. And people will be very ingenious at finding a way to, if not level the playing field, to completely change it so that what that big actor has doesn't really work. And, and so I don't think it'll be about leveling it. I think it'll be about changing it in some way. And someone will get a break who's small and completely knock off balance someone who's big. And that's what we've seen consistently. Um, so I think that's how it'll go. But it's, it's interesting whether violence should be fair. It's not because of power. So, um, yeah. Um, Bye, great to see an ICRC person. That's lovely. Innovating, you're right to make me practical. Um, concrete ways that we're innovating around law at the moment is that we're working very, we know we have a sort of special new weapons um, science kind of group. And we've just also hired, for the first time, a, a really high-level cyber computer person. So we're going to get much better at understanding that whole side of AI and um, ML and things as well. So what we're doing there is what we always do. We're trying to promote discussions by states around these new weapons challenges. So there is a, um, and I'm a bit jet-lagged, so I've forgotten. The type, but there's a part of the Conventional Weapons um, Commission, what's it called? The, the group of states that, you know, the Intergovernmental Process on Conventional Weapons, and they have set up a committee on autonomous weapons. So there is a process trying to present to states now innovative ways to legislate and to come up with laws and principles to um, add to IHL or to interpret with IHL so that policy is shaped towards these weapons. So that's how we're trying to innovate the law with states. And actually, India is chairing that group. Um, an Indian ambassador um, on the disarmament um, committee in Geneva is chairing that. So that's Asian-driven, which is interesting, actually. On the ground, what are we doing? Um, we're trying to do tech for good. So we are trying to do what... Um, Martin is saying we're trying to develop drones and ways of applying new technology to create a digital transformation in humanitarian action so we reach people more directly, more quickly, more relevantly in certain ways, and we know what they need in certain ways, despite the problems. And I'm not sure, I don't know, Isabel, if you're aware of other ways in which on the ground we're trying to innovate and help people cope with these kind of new weapons technologies. I'm not sure, but we'll find out for you. I'm mostly sitting in policy and law, aware of the legal innovations. In terms of uh, new, techno new technology and, and new weapons, uh, I think it's more at the, at the very diplomatic level mm -hmm. and the policy level where we are trying to probably make uh, the case of, uh, you know, that norms 
and uh, international humanitarian law will still apply. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of our important uh, attempts. You know, it's not because there is um, an evolution in the technology and new weapons uh, that uh, we have to reinvent all the, the regulatory uh, uh, framework. And because, you know, I mean, that, that's very, very much a risk, I would say, when something is changing, when something is evolving, when there are new trends. We have uh, been going through this kind of uh, phase already a few years ago, you know, when there was this uh, war on, global war on terror, where a uh, number of, uh, including states, were arguing that uh, maybe uh, IHL is not relevant any longer. And it has been a long journey to, to uh, to, to uh, ensure that uh, this is uh, this is not the case, and that uh, norms and values can still uh, be applicable, even in, if there is an evolution uh, in, in, in uh, the reality, and that what we are speaking about or seeing today was not existing 50 years ago. So I think okay, it's not really innovative innovation, of course, um, but uh, in terms of uh, of uh, how to address these new challenges related to the new weapons. I think it's also very uh, important to maintain this, this dialogue at very high level, policy level, uh, with states, with the, the different actors to, to ensure that uh, we can still address issues uh, with, uh, with something that, that, that has been agreed upon and is still relevant. I think that's absolutely right. I think what what Isabel said is right because we feel the law is still totally relevant and it's a question of adapting current weapons and practices to that law. We still think that, as I said, distinction, proportionality, precaution, etc., can be managed through these weapons with humans in the loop. That's where we are, I think. Yeah. Um, Rahila had a question about children and Syria. I mean, I think, as you point out, the, the terrible thing, I mean, it's it would be terrible either way, but the, the obvious thing in, in most of the Syrian conflict is that children are being killed and hurt and um, wounded and losing their parents and their schools and their lives, as it were, because of really old-fashioned weapons. We're talking about a lot of barrel bombs just being pushed out of the back of airplanes, and as you say, we're talking about crude chemical weapons as well. So it's the... It's the old thing, you don't need high-tech weapons to do terrible things. We've been doing it in the loop. As humans in the loop, we've been violating IHL for you know, generations. Um, your point about accountability and you know, how could we deal with next generation justice, um, you know, I think that's just a, the same challenge as ever because even if, if the law is there, it's usually political power that dictates whether or not there are accountability processes. And um, again, going back to Kwang's point, that's where there's usually a bias of power, and some people are brought to the law and others are not. And I think that's what will go on. Whether, and I'm not enough of a, a lawyer here to know whether, in a sense, the existing Geneva Conventions capture next generational injury um, or later life injury. If there's a sort of cumulative impact idea in the nature of wars. So even if it doesn't look like a violation or a human, you know, damage now, it is damage later. Um, but it's an interesting point. I'll say the children doing anything about that. Are you trying to innovate legally or policy-wise? Uh, at the moment, I mean, I think it's very much about the first response and access. Um, yeah. it's, it's absolutely, uh, it's that one that calls out ACT and Syria and the Syrian can't get it. I'm looking at operations around the Turkey border, but uh, working only through local partners in actually uh, Syria. And yes, it's very much about the first response phase still, you know, seven, eight years in. Um, and we haven't been able to get to a point where we can do any of the other aspects of the program that we'd, we'd like to. And I think, I mean, it's very important to put these things in context, because of course you're going to be 100 years old next year as an organization, and you emerge from the blockades against access to aid and food um, by the British, my people, and probably yours by the sound of it, and other people, um, to blockade Germany and Austria after the war and punish them and their civilian populations by blockading them. And you know, aid couldn't get in then, which is why you were founded as Save the Children. And you know, I think that kind of policy will continue. I mean, when people in power decide to be brutal and cruel, they 
they usually have the hard power to do it. And humanitarian action is always operating on soft power, which often can't negotiate its way in. Of course, and Yemen as well. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ancient problem. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think we had a very interesting conversation, a, a lot of kind of forward-looking kind of thinking. I, I would like to close also mentioning that technology can be a force for good. Uh, we, we've been uh, focusing on one side of technology, but a lot of the things that are happening today and most interesting things that are happening today are actually through technology and humanitarian uh, workers around the world are actually taking advantage of many other technology from GIS technologies to crowdsource information and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of positive happening there. So I, I don't want to give this impression that you know we're going to a, a world of, of, of warfare or of, that we can't really predict uh, reality is these things will probably balance out. Right? We will mm -hmm. also have tools that we will develop to kind of address those issues. But obviously these are huge concerns and not only uh, from uh, so a military strategy point of view, from an ethical point of view. So I really appreciated that kind of ethical and as well as human point of view. Um, Uwe, thank you very much. It was an honor to have you here at our school. Uh, we hope to host you again um, as practitioner or as academic uh, in the future. Uh, thank you very much also to ICRC uh, because we are partnering with them. Uh, Jenny Fernandez has been great uh, with our students. Uh, so we really appreciate this opportunity to work with all of you. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you.